I'd like to continue talking to you this morning about surviving and thriving. Last week we talked about um, following God or following Jesus, and we said uh, something really deep and really profound, and that is that if we want to be a follower of Jesus, we need to follow. We looked at Hebrews, or Hebrews, we looked at Luke 9, um, starting in verse 23, and Jesus was talking to people. He said to them, he said to all of them, those who want to come with me must say no to the things they want. Pick up their crosses every day and follow me. I'd read that in my own devotions and I saw the importance of us not just talking about Jesus and not just giving our hearts to him and then doing what we want to in life, but I saw the importance of us actually following Jesus Christ. Today, though, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to follow in a practical sense. I want to show you how it plays out in our life. And remember, the motivation for what I'm talking about is for us to survive and to do much more than survive, but to thrive when life throws whatever it would at us. I'm talking to you from basically Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. And in it, he... Um, talks about how Jesus basically is laying a framework for us to survive and thrive. And he uses the illustration of if we built our house on solid rock, it will be able to withstand storms and different things that come at it, right? If we build our house or if we build our lives on sand, then when different things come, then it's just like everything is going to collapse or it has a lot more tendency to collapse. So we've been looking at Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount so that we can um, build our, ho our, our house, we can build our lives on solid ground so that we can survive and we can thrive. You need to understand that Jesus' motivation for telling people this was so that their lives could be built on a firm foundation. He's not just giving us a bunch of rules and different things for us to uh, follow in life, but he's giving us a pattern, he's giving us a formula so that we can do more than just exist, so that we can survive whatever life throws at us, and we can do even more than that, we can thrive. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about how if we're going to thrive, we need to recognize that we're lost without God. Um, I'm not going to read them to you, but, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who mourn. And basically what that was talking about was that when we understand that we're in a desperate place without Jesus Christ, then our hearts can be open to receive from him. If you think you've got absolutely everything together in your life, it's awfully hard to receive what God wants to give to you. So we need to understand that we're desperate without him, and sometimes we just need to come to an end of ourself so that we can experience more of what he has for us. So we're lost without him, and we need to, we need to understand that. And this week I want to talk to you about loving your enemies. And I want to show you this morning that if you love your enemies, you're building a foundation for you yourself to thrive. And it doesn't make any sense on the surface, but I want to give you some examples from Scripture and from real life how if we love our enemies, it actually helps us to thrive. Make sense? When Jesus talks to the people about loving their enemies, he's not talking to the crowd at general, in general, he's talking to his disciples and people who are following him. He says in Luke 6, 20, Jesus, it says that Jesus looked at his disciples and then he said. So we need to understand that he's talking to followers of, of him. He's not talking 
to the world at large. He's talking to people who claim that he is their Lord and he's talking to people who want to follow him. And he's telling them what following looks like in a practical sense. Once again, he, his motivation is for us to build our lives on a firm foundation. Okay, got that? So can I move on? Okay, this is what he says in Luke chapter 6. He says, but to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to take them back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will be and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. You know, we read a passage like this, and if you're like me, it's really tempting to just jump over it. It's really tempting to just say, yeah, right, I know I should do that, but it's not easy to do it because this totally goes against our natural tendencies to love people who hate us. This is not a normal thing for us to do. You need to understand that Jesus is continuing with the, thro with the thought from the last beatitude that he's talking about just a few verses up. He says, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. Blessed. We said earlier, we said blessed means that we're happy and it has the impression of us having favorable circumstances as well. So why would Jesus ever say that we're blessed when people hate us and exclude us and, ex and insult us and reject us? Why should we be happy about that? And why should we have the impression of us having favorable circumstances when these things come against us? Why would he say that? Because, in a nutshell, it puts us in a place where we ourselves can be blessed. And I want to give you an illustration of Scripture, from Scripture. I want to show you how we ourselves put ourselves in a place where we can be blessed if we're willing to love people who hate us, who curse us, and who abuse us, and if we're um, responding by doing good and blessing and praying for and being compassionate to others. Why would we put ourselves, or why would we be blessed for doing this? Jesus um, tells us that if we do this, the first, the, the first and most obvious answer is that we have great reward in heaven. In Luke 6, 23, he says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. So the fact of the matter is, if we're willing to love our enemies, we're storing up eternal rewards for ourselves. You know, it's preached to us many times that we need to save money for our retirement, right? How many of you, I won't ask that. We're lectured that we're supposed to save money for our retirement. We're supposed to 
uh, and it's wise to do that. But when we love our enemies, when we're good to those, what we're doing is we're storing up eternal rewards for ourselves. But it's much more than that. We're doing much more than just storing up eternal rewards for ourselves. We're putting ourselves in a place where we can experience the grace of God in our own life to a much greater degree. In fact, I really believe that you can say, if we're not willing to love our enemies, we really, we really limit what God wants to do in our own lives. We really limit Him in our own lives if we're not willing to love those people who don't love us. And let me say too, before I go any farther, to love is not just... Saying, yeah, I care about people and remaining far away from them, holding them at arm's length. To love people means that we do good to them. It means that we do good to them and we think positive thoughts about them to the degree that it evokes emotions within each one of us. You know, to say that we love and to ignore just doesn't go together. To love means that we take action. And we need to um, experience, we need to care enough about people that we, it actually changes what we do and how we think about people. Does that make sense? So, let me give you an example from Scripture to show you the blessings that come when we're willing to love our enemy. And I want to show you, um, I want to tell you a story from Acts chapter 16. And the setting for the story is Paul and Silas have gone to Philippi. That's a major city in Macedonia. They've gone there to plant a church, basically. They've gone there to share the good news of Jesus. And they meet a person, a lady called Lydia, and they share the good news of Jesus with her, and she and her family become followers of Jesus. And then Paul and Silas, with her, they stay at her house, and they use it as a base, and then they go around sharing the good news of the gospel with other people, and they develop a small group of people who are willing to be followers of Jesus. Now, at the same time, there's a slave girl who has a demon and this demon would let this slave girl tell um, people's fortunes and her owners received a lot of money from this and the apostle Paul got tired of her following around and disrupting her disrupting their meeting so the apostle Paul casts the demon out of this slave girl and the owners of the slave girl don't take kindly to this because they recognize that their means of getting wealth has vanished. And so they cause a riot. And look what happens in Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 22. It says, um, the crowd joined in the attack against the against Paul and Silas. Then the officials tore the clothes off Paul and Silas and ordered the guards to beat them with sticks. After they had hit Paul and Silas many times, they threw them in jail and ordered the jailer to keep them under tight security. So the jailer followed these orders and put Paul and Silas into solitary confinement with their legs in irons. Now if anyone had an opportunity to be upset, it would have been Paul and Silas, right? They're in this city. They're trying to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're trying to um, bring people to a place where they can enjoy life more, where they can have a better life, they can have a better existence. And what happens to them while they're preaching the gospel? Um, some people start a riot they're taken to the um, officials of the city and they have them beaten 
and then they're taken to a jail, and the jailer um, puts them in solitary confinement and puts them in stocks. And I don't think he was very nice and gentle when he was doing this. Now, how many of you, in all reality, if that happened to you, you would say, let me out of this city. I want to get out of here. I do not like what's happening. I just want to disappear. I think both of my hands would be up. You know, that's just reality. But that is not Paul and Silas's response. What they do is when they're in jail, Scripture tells us that they spent the night praying and they spent the night singing praises to God. So here they are. They could be complaining about this city. They could be complaining that God brought them there and they know that they were there. I don't have time to get into that this morning. They could be complaining about what's going on. They could decide that they were going to turn their back on the city and never want to go there or have anything to do with it again. But instead, they're praying and they're um, singing songs of praise. So I can imagine they're praying for the very people who have abused them. They're praying for their enemies. In a nutshell, what the Apostle Paul and his... Uh, The Apostle Paul and Silas, in a nutshell, what they're doing is they're loving their enemies in a practical sense. Look at the results of them doing that. There's an earthquake that comes. I'm not saying that loving their enemies caused the earthquake to come, but I am saying it did happen. And the jail was shook to such an extent that the doors of the jail flew open and the leg irons fell off of them. And the jailer wakes up and he sees the doors of the prison are open and he's there and he wants to commit suicide. And the Apostle Paul hollers out to him, don't do that, don't do that, we're all here. You see, I I really believe if the Apostle Paul wouldn't have made such an impact by praying for the people, if he wouldn't have made such an impact with his attitude that wasn't against everything and everybody, he made such an impact that the prisoners were there with him and they didn't run away. And then look what happens. The jailer sees that they're all there, and he gives his life to Jesus Christ. Not only him, but his whole family become followers of Jesus. His whole family becomes a Christian. And why is that? Simply because the Apostle Paul was willing to love his enemies. Can you see what a profound effect that has? But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. The the leaders of the city come and they apologize to the Apostle Paul and to Silas and they escort them out of the prison and they said, would you guys please leave our city? And the Apostle Paul doesn't listen to them. What he does is he holds another church meeting in Lydia's house And I bet you the jailer was at that meeting. I mean, I can't prove that from Scripture, but I bet you the jailer was at that meeting. And you know what else they do then for the Apostle Paul? And this this is really cool. I would never saw this before in Scripture. I know probably most of you have, and I'm showing my ignorance here this morning. But I never, I never put together what the Apostle Paul talked about in Philippians to this very event. Look at how the Apostle Paul, um, in his letter to the church at Philippi, in his, the book in Scripture that we call the book of Philippines, I never um, understood that this was the same group of people that Paul had experienced being beaten and put in prison, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the story I just told. So look what, how the Apostle Paul views these people. He says, I want to thank God for all of the memories I have of you in Philippians chapter 1. 
I want to thank my God for all of the memories I have of you. Every time I pray for all of you, I do it with joy. Isn't that cool? You see, the rewards for loving our enemy. And then if we jump to chapter 4, we have even more insight into Paul's relationship with the church at Philippi. Paul says to them in Philippians 4, starting at verse 15, he says, You Philippians also know that in the early days, early days he was in jail, right? You Philippians, Philippines also know that in the early days when I left the province of Macedonia to speak the good news, you use, you were the only church to share your money with me. You gave me what I needed and you received what I gave you. Even while I was in Thessalonia, you provided for my needs twice. So do you know what happened at that meeting after the Apostle Paul was in jail? They took up an offering for him. They took up an offering for him and they supported him in his mission work. And not only did they just take up that offering for him, but they sent him money twice more. They supported him. So the Apostle Paul, because he was willing to love his enemies, even though he was put in jail, even though he was abused, they became his source of support while he's on the mission field. He says that nobody else supported me, only you guys did this. Can you see, when we love our enemies, it puts us in a place where we can be blessed. If the Apostle Paul would have been in prison and would have um, had a bad attitude towards the whole thing, and he would have been muttering curses under his breath towards the people at Philippi, He wouldn't have received the support. He wouldn't have had these people supporting him when he's on the mission field. I want you to know that if we're willing to love our enemies, it puts us in a place where God can bless us. Is this easy to do? Absolutely not. Is it natural to do? Absolutely not. It's totally unnatural. But if we're willing to do this, if we're willing to love people who hate us, if we're willing to do that, and it shows in what we do, It shows in in how we treat them. It shows in our attitude towards them. If we're willing to do that, I want you to know you're on the verge of being blessed. You're putting yourself in a place where God can do amazing things in your life. You see, there's there's a principle in life that I have noticed, and that is that every time God wants to use me to a greater degree, every time God wants to do more in my own life, it comes with a period of testing. I was talking to Stephen this last week, and didn't Stephen do an awesome job leading praise and worship here this morning? What is that, the third time you've done that? And he told me when I was visiting with him, he says when he decided that he would lead praise and worship in our church, it's just like everything conspired against him. That, those your words pretty well? Thank you. You need to back me up when I say this. Okay. <laughs> When I was talking to Stephen, he was telling me what a great pastor I am. He was, te- he was telling me how handsome I am. Right, Stephen? <laughs> yeah. No, that, that isn't true, by the way. Um, but I have noticed in life, whenever God wants to use you to a greater degree, whenever there's stuff going on, that God wants to promote you, it comes with a period of testing. It comes with a period of where it seems like everything conspires against you. And if you are willing to push through in periods like that, if you're willing to to remain faithful to Jesus Christ, if you're willing to follow him even when you don't want to, if you're willing to go and to do what you know he wants you to do, even if you don't want to. Yes, there will be times where it seems like, what is the point in doing this? But if you can push through those boundaries, if you can push through those barriers, 
you will receive the blessings of God. If you're willing to love your enemies, not just in, yeah, I love my enemies, but if you're willing to do good to those people who hate you, if you're willing to, to pray for people who are going to mistreat you, if you're willing to, to, in a very practical sense, help them, I don't have time to tell you all of the stories that I could this morning, but if you're willing to do that in a practical way, you are putting yourself in a place where God can bless you. When the Apostle Paul was willing to do that, he had no idea that he was setting up a support system for himself. I have no idea what God wants to do in your life, by you simply loving that neighbor that is a real pain. I have simply no idea what God wants to do in your life by you loving that co-worker that's shooting you down all the time and trying to bring you discouragement. I have no idea that what God wants to do in your life by you loving that boss who makes fun of you in front of everybody. But one thing I do know, if you're willing to love them, it's putting you in a place where God can bless you. Not only are you storing up eternal rewards for yourself, but you are also putting yourself in a place where you can be blessed. You're not doing it because you're looking for the blessing. You're doing it because this is what you're called to do and you're following Jesus Christ. And you know, following Jesus Christ builds our life on a firm foundation so that wherever we go and whatever we do and whatever life throws at us, and trust me, life throws different things at us, but we're putting ourselves in a place where we can be successful when life throws its worst at us. Let's bow our heads and pray.